On the 30th of January 1933, the President of Germany, Hindenburg, appointed Adolf Hitler as Chancellor. Hitler had not won an election, nor any form of parliamentary majority. Hindenburg was persuaded to do this, above all, by three conservatives. Business magnate Alfred Hugenberg, right-wing politician Franz von Papen, and Hindenburg's own son, Oscar. Hindenburg had allowed the conservatives to persuade him to do this against his better will. The appointment did not please everyone. One person it didn't please was Hindenburg's former colleague in arms from World War I, Erich Ludendorff. Ludendorff showed his displeasure in the following letter to Hindenburg, dated two days later. I solemnly prophesy that this accursed man will cast our Reich into the abyss and bring our nation to inconceivable misery. Future generations will damn you in your grave for what you have done. That is the translation of the message given in Ian Kershaw's book on Hitler. To find the Tannenberg Memorial, it's not particularly difficult. It's on Google Maps. Parking, well, that may be a bit of a problem. There's a bit of a parking in the forest before you get here. Leave it there. Or alternatively, somewhere alongside the main road. Alongside the main road, there's a number of places you can actually leave a vehicle. We've got two signs. First one's here. I'll read the sign to you. In the years 1925 to 27, in the vicinity of Olsztynek, the Germans built a monument memorizing the victorious battle over the Russian army under command of General Samsonov in August 1914. The battle has been called the Tannenberg Battle. Bodies of 20 unknown German soldiers killed in that battle were buried at the monument. The monument had a shape of an octagon and consisted of eight towers connected with a brick wall. The monument was a symbol of heroism of German soldiers in the First World War. In 1934, the body of the Tannenberg battle leader, Paul von Hindenburg, was buried here. He later became the president of Germany. In Nazi times, Tannenberg Denkmal gained the highest rank of a na nationwide monument and became a place of pilgrimages. After the war, it was completely dismantled. Only some foundations and the bodies of 20 unknown German soldiers remain until today. This is what is left of what I think was the largest war memorial in the world at the time Ludendorff sent the message to Hindenburg. This is the exact spot of the centre of the Tannenberg Memorial, built to commemorate the Second Battle of Tannenberg in 1914 and the dead of the entire First World War. Today, very little is left of it. However, this memorial was in the 1930s the very focal point of the cult around Hindenburg and Ludendorff as the men who had jointly saved Germany from Russian invasion. They were the two greatest living Germans, the best known leaders of World War I, men who had worked closely together to foil invasion in 1914. That was the legend, and in my opinion, was precisely a legend, but 
As we shall see, it was not the only one. Ludendorff had clearly fallen out with Hitler, but that was not always so. In 1923, Hitler had planned a putsch against the German state. This putsch was carried out in a Munich drinking establishment. A Munich drinking establishment may seem like a good place to start a putsch, as if it fails, at least you can get yourself totally sloshed in order to drown your sorrows. Ludendorff at the time denied having been involved in the planning stage, although his son later admitted that he had. It is of course somewhat hard to believe that the man who had allegedly planned the battles at Liège and in East Prussia in 1914, some of the great battles in the East and the Western Front offensives in 1918 could have been involved. That was possibly the way it appeared at the time. The Putschists had managed to take over a beer hall where the leaders of Bavaria were meeting together with an army barracks and kidnap a number of prominent politicians. For good measure, they also terrorised a number of the citizens of Munich and robbed a number of businesses, netting a fortune, most of which was never seen again. It seems as though their plans were then to march on Berlin. After all, the previous year Mussolini had marched on Rome and seized power and Hitler and his cronies had gone on a weekend out to Coburg so it might have seemed possible. Possibly they did not realise that despite what the propaganda might have claimed Mussolini went to Rome on the train and the king instead of turning the army and police against the rebels had given in. The march on Coburg did not result in anything more than a handful of new supporters for National Socialism. If you get a globe, the whole world, and look up Munich and Berlin, you'll see there's some distance between the two. Nearly 600 kilometres. That's a long way to march. Once the beer hall had run out of beer, hundreds of tired and hungover Nazi rebels needed something to do, whilst the authorities organised themselves to counter the putsch. Whilst Hitler was stewing about what to do next, Ludendorff had insisted on a march to the centre of Munich. The point of this was, I think, to see if the army and police would stop them and to make a demonstration of force to the locals. The police did stop them. A confrontation with the police took place which resulted in 20 deaths, possibly more, and many injured. Ludendorff had been involved in right-wing politics in Weimar, Germany for some time. He was effectively the leader of Germany in 1917 to 1918 and had to flee the country at the end of World War I with a false beard and probably a silly hat. He did not stay out of the country for long. He returned and he was involved in the Cat Putsch in 1920. This failed, but it did not affect his liberty. He went to live in Munich, a curious choice given his hatred of Catholics. Around this time he met Hitler for the first time, introduced to him probably by early Nazi Max Erwin von Schobner Richter. Legends were built around the beer hall putsch by the Nazis. Hitler, it was said, had saved a critically injured boy and carried him to safety. This argument forgets that he dislocated his shoulder. In fact, Hitler ran away. Ludendorff, it was said, calmly walked towards the police line who were shooting at the rebels. In fact, the American consul saw him taking cover and lying on the ground like everyone else. Nonetheless, these stories persisted about the bravery of the general. Ludendorff was arrested, but released home after a few hours of questioning. At his trial, which started on the 24th of February 1924, he was escorted back and forth by a limousine. Not unsurprisingly, he was found not guilty. It's often said that Hitler and Ludendorff fell out when they were at the beer hall or shortly afterwards. Indeed, this is the argument presented in the TV production Hitler, The Rise of Evil. Ludendorff had released the three most important hostages whilst Hitler was away, under promise that they would return. Although the putsch was doomed before that, it, this was the final nail in the coffin. However, at the time, Hitler wasn't too bothered about the hostages being released. Ludendorff later stood in the 1925 presidential elections. Hitler, it would seem, persuaded him to do it amongst others. Another myth is that it was Hindenburg who defeated him at this election. In fact, Ludendorff was a candidate only in the first round where he received a little more than 1% of the vote and looked pretty foolish as a result. 
Hindenburg only became a candidate in the second round, so that they never competed against each other. However, there is little doubt that Ludendorff was a very bitter man. It was he, more than anyone else, who fostered the stab in the back myth, whereby the soldiers at the front in the war were stabbed by socialists at home. The truth is that it was Ludendorff himself who almost had a complete breakdown weeks before the end of the war and who had urged the Kaiser to come to terms with the Allies. He was bitter against the right and against Hitler, who, as a Catholic, was one of the very kind who Ludendorff blamed for the defeat. He also blamed Jews and all forms of socialists and democrats. He fell into a world of far-fetched conspiracy theories. However, his prophecy to Hindenburg about Hitler certainly proved to be correct. That is, of course, if this also is not a myth. And what is strange about it is that there's no record of it anywhere. Franz Freiherr Karl von Bebenberg was the editor of Ludendorff's memoirs from 1933 to 1937. He stated that a copy of this letter or telegram was not found in the estate. Von Bebenberg belonged to the extreme right and published conspiracy theories based around race hate and was married to the daughter of Ludendorff's second wife from her first husband. There's also no record of it anywhere in the addressee's files, that is to say the files of the Presidential Chancellery, which was then headed by State Secretary Otto Meissner. Ludendorff's other letters to Hindenburg from 1933 onwards can be found there. These letters complain about a number of things, most promptly the unfair treatment towards him and his supporters. Meissner did not mention the message of the 1st of February 1933 in his memoirs published in 1950 and entitled State Secretary under Ebert, Hindenburg and Hitler. The very first record of this letter appears in the memoirs of the former Reich Minister and Governor General in Poland, Hans Frank. These records can be found online on the website of Yad Vashem and were written in prison in Nuremberg in 1946. Obviously, Frank did not have access to archives and was compiling everything from memory. These memoirs were not published until 1953. In 1935, Frank was Minister of Justice in Bavaria and as such would have seen a number of cases of crimes of violence committed by Nazi supporters, as well as with unlawful interventions of Himmler's political police into criminal prosecutions. There is no doubt that Ludendorff did complain about such activity in letters to the president before he died in August 1934. You bear responsibility for the conditions of lawlessness in the Reich today before your God, before your oath to the constitution and before the German people, he wrote on the 6th of July 1933. On the 18th of November 1933 he wrote... When one day the history of the German people is written, then the end of your Reich presidency will be the blackest time in German history. I think we could agree, in both of these cases, he was absolutely correct. Frank remembered Ludendorff's alleged letter dated the 1st of February 1933 as follows. By appointing Hitler as Reich Chancellor, you have given us one of the greatest demagogues of all time delivered to the Holy German Fatherland. I solemnly prophesy to you that this unfortunate man is pushing our country into the abyss and our nation into incomprehensible places. He will bring misery and generations to come will curse you for your complicity. That's now my translation, which is slightly different to the one that was given earlier. Hans Frank was not the only one to write of such a letter. Wilhelm Buchner was a confidant of Ludendorff and had participated in the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923 with him. He was later Hitler's adjutant. He wrote of a message on the 1st of February 1933 written by Ludendorff. By appointing Hitler as Chancellor, you have handed our holy German fatherland over to one of the greatest demagogues of all time. I prophesy to you solemnly that this unfortunate man will plunge our country into the abyss and will bring the nation into incomprehensible misery. Generations to come will curse you in your grave for this act. I suspect that Bruckner is remembering not what Ludendorff wrote, but what Hans Frank says he wrote. 
This recollection was made 20 years after the event and just before Bruckner's own death in 1954, aged 69. This quotation of words to that effect have been reproduced in a number of publications. Indeed, it appeared in an unpublished text on the Institute of Contemporary History in Munich in the 1950s. However, the Institute has made it clear that the source has not been verified and, as such, believes that Ludendorff sent no such text to Hindenburg at all. In other words, Ludendorff's alleged letter is probably nothing other than a myth. I also believe that's a myth that Ludendorff was the planner of the Battle of Tannenberg, but that's a story for another time. I hope you found this interesting. I upload every Friday at 20 hundred hours Central European time. That's where I live, between Germany and Poland, and sometimes on other days as well. If you found this story of Hitler's rise to power interesting, you might also like to see the video I did on the march on Coburg in 1922. But for the moment... Thank you for your attention. Bye for now.